At this juncture, I'm going to introduce our presenters for today. We have Ruth and Angela. I believe we can all see them at the um, shared video. Ruth uh, is an associate dean and professor at Azusa Pacific School of Nursing in Azusa, California. Dr. Ruth has been awarded numerous state and federal grants to support midwifery education. Most recently, she was the PI on a HRSA, Advanced Nursing Education Workforce grant that expanded women's health services in a rural health clinic and provided traineeship to midwifery students in underserved and rural areas. In 1991, Dr. Ruth founded a nurse midwifery practice in downtown Los Angeles, which continues as the largest OBGYN midwifery practice in Los Angeles, offering water, bath, and collaborative midwife OBGYN management. In addition to her academic role, Dr. Ruth continues in this full scope practice where she precepts medical residents and nurse midwife students. Professional services include her current role on the nice nurse midwifery advisory committee for the California Board of Registered Nurses, past president of the California Nurse Midwives Association, contributor or reviewer for the Journal of Midwifery and Women's Health, and trainer for perinatal home visitors as part of Los Angeles Best Babies Network. Her research interests are gestational weight gain, gestational diabetes, newborn male circumcision, rural health issues related to perinatal health, and midwifery management, intrapartum and postpartum. Uh, that's Dr. Ruth. Next is Angela. Angela is an assistant professor and the program director of the Women's Health Nurse Practitioner and Nurse Midwifery Program at California State University in Fullerton, California. Dr. Sojobi is also an experienced certified midwife of 28 years and currently provide care to women at Martin Luther King Community Hospital in Southern California. As a certified nurse midwife, Dr. Sojobi seeks high quality and equitable health care to women throughout the lifespan, throughout the lifespan, with a special emphasis on the prevention of adverse perinatal outcomes. As an educator, Dr. Sojobi's goal is to help students become intentional learners who believe in lifelong learning and actively seek knowledge to assist women and to achieve optimal health. Dr. Sojobi's research focus is on applying a socio-ecological model to study chronic illnesses, particularly gestational diabetes, with a focus on how social support can enhance self-management and glycemic control. Those will be our presenters for today. Um, I'll hand over to them so okay. that they can take us through. Okay. Angela? Very, very good. Actually, what I'm going to do is, if it's okay with everyone, Angela, um, first of all, thank you for everyone for allowing um, Angela and I to be a part of this and for Jackson and all of those at VIDM for help figuring out all of our time zones. <laughs> we're, we're lucky we're all here, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm doing a little traveling in Italy. Angela, my midwife buddy and uh, colleague is in LA and Jackson is in Kenya and all of you are where you are. <laughs> so that's, it's pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to be the I'm on an iPhone. So Angela is is going to be advancing the slides for the parts of my presentation. Sorry, I know that's a little irritating. Um, but um, I also want as as Angela and I talk about 
this substance that we use or starting to use, I want you to think about ways that you can join the conversation after the presentation, because Angela and I decided to do this because we want to hear from you. And uh, we're in the United States, um, and I would love to hear what's going on in your part of the world. So with that being said, I'm not going to read the objectives uh, verbatim. You'll see these as we go through. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Angela. Hang on one second. If Jackson is still there, oh, there we go. I do have control now. Okay. There we go. All right. So this, this slide is, I think, for, for folks that are here, this is, we know this that we know that hemorrhage, specifically postpartum hemorrhage, is a leading cause of um, maternal mortality and morbidity worldwide. From a U.S. perspective, even in our resource-rich country, 11% of pregnancy-related deaths were due to hemorrhage. And this is in a setting that has things, that has IVs, that has pharmacologic agents, that has Bakri balloons and, and all those kind of fancy schmancy things. Um, you know, on the bigger scale globally, postpartum hemorrhage is associated with 25% or one out of four delivery associated deaths. And I want to go ahead, Angela, and I want to be very clear that we're going to really focusing on postpartum hemorrhage today, recognizing that obstetric hemorrhage can occur, can occur antipartally as well, but 80% of obstetric hemorrhage actually occurs postpartum. Next. So in this uh, world view, and you may not be able to read this very well, but what this is, is maternal mortality per 100,000 alive births. And this is a World Health Organization slides. And um, I'll, I'll read down there, um, it, it postpartum hemorrhage accounts for 8% uh, of maternal deaths in the developed countries. And you're thinking, well, Ruth, you just said it, it counted 11. Well, uh, that's 11% in the United States. But now when we throw in the other developing or the developed nations, industrialized nations, it's actually about 8%. However, what is concerning in of itself beyond that, that is concerned, but in um, less developed countries, up to 60% of maternal, maternal deaths in developing countries. And you know, you can't see this very well. On the bottom left is the legend. And the darkest, darkest purple rectangle there actually represents, um, it represents a thousand deaths per hundred thousand. And you don't see a lot of those darker, but if you see the, the pinker ones toward the bottom of the scale, kind of the fuchsia and the less pink, th those are, those are fi like 500 to 999 maternal deaths out of a hundred thousand, way, way more than we need um, at all. So let's let's talk about that and hopefully we'll get some good interaction on how we can be part of the chain. So um, next slide, please. So in the United States, I'm showing this slide because um, I have um, had the opportunity to present this with another colleague, um, Sarah Obermeyer, who's now actually, I guess I should put a shout out for Frontier um, Nursing University. She's now a faculty. She was a co-faculty with me. But we wanted to point out that in the United States, as in many other countries, there are national and statewide initiatives to um, address obstetric hemorrhage and postpartum hemorrhage specifically. And I've listed those on the left. I won't um, read those. Um, I want you, if you have not figured out what those are in your district, in your country, in your area, please, please see what those are. And of course, the World Health Organization is kind of our go-to as midwives globally. Um, and on the right, you'll see some things. Um, I, I tried to include all sorts of uh, clinicians. But one of the things that you, I noticed that we had at least one community member on here, and you may not be the person that's actually touching the childbearing person in labor and attending their birth, but you may be in a position in a community to identify the, the woman who has definitive risk factors that may even risk her out of delivering in your, your community, that she may actually need to go to a higher level of care. So anyways, we're, we're trying to make this um, a, li a little bit of something for everyone. So um, go ahead, Angela, next slide. So I'm gonna talk about um, physiologic changes of pregnancy and how tranexamic acid or TXA works. Next slide. So in this one, 
this is one of those, those of us that have gone to um, a lot of schooling, and I know there's a lot of us on this call, um, cumulatively, there's a lot of years of schooling here, right? Um, I think many people, when they hear about the clotting cascade, their eyes roll back in their head and they're like, are you kidding? What do we have to know about that? You know, there's extrinsic and intrinsic factors. And I am gonna try to point out some critical things. First of all, pregnancy, number one, is a physiologic hypercoagulable state. And this is a preventive state. Women that are in pregnancy, and if you could go to the next slide again, Angela, it flipped back. There you go. So fortunately, women have this ability to clot better during pregnancy, okay? They have increase in clotting factors. Um, they have um, decrease in fibrinolysis. We're gonna be talking about that term quite a bit. Fibrinolysis, lysis means cutting, cutting fibrin. So if you have a decrease in your fibrinolysis, that means your clots stay around better. So I want you to go to the right on the slide and you can see at the, uh, there's the, the little, you see that red blood cell is kind of circulating in the left and that is injury. That's representing injury that's occurring. When there is actually birth, um, when the placenta comes off the myometrium, that is basically an injury. And what we want to happen is we want to have our friends, the platelets, which you can see in the middle little picture, the platelets aggregate to the place where there's injury, okay? So the, the platelets are there and they are waiting, they're waiting for fibrin um, to come and actually thrombin activates uh, uh, prothrombin, um, uh, or excuse me, fibrinogen to make fibrin. And I wanted to mention something, fibrinogen. I wanted to mention this, if any of you have access to seeing lab work on your gals, when they're uh, maybe you maybe they have a hypertensive disorder and you happen to have run some some lab work on them to see if they may have actual preeclampsia you'll notice on many of our women you see higher fibrinogen well that's a good thing that's a good thing that's an insoluble part of the plasma it's a protein and actually when it is converted to plasmin as you can see there, um, excuse me, fibrin, sorry. Now this is where the slides get small, fibrin. Fibrin contributes to the platelets to make a wonderful clot. And, and the main concept in this slide is for you to think we want to maintain clotability. We want to maintain fibrin. And that's exactly what TXA does. If you go back to the bottom left of the slide, you will see a part that says, in severe blood loss, when you have women, and I know this happens, especially some of you that are in rural areas, um, for, a, for a piece of time, I was in Kenya and they, they had IVs there, but they had no blood products. And um, when there was severe blood loss, they, women could actually lose enough of their blood where they'd had really so few platelets left that they could even start the clotting process. Um, and again, fibrinogen and platelets both are necessary for that. So that's the first slide. I want you to tuck that away. Remember, fibrin is our friend, okay, in terms of postpartum hemorrhage. Next slide. So this one is a common, if you wanna call it mnemonic that we use in OB, it's the four T's, tone, tissue, trauma, thrombin. Well, really there's two reasons why women can have experienced death or morbidity relative to hemorrhage. And, and there are, and there's somebody else talking. Can you hear that? I benefited. Thank you. Thank you. There are, of, of these four etiology of, of hemorrhage, there are really two that we wanna think about that are germane here, it's tone. And, and, and then ultimately we're thinking about clotting, okay? Um, and you can see that little picture there is a kind of a cross section of a placenta. It's the U upside down, uh, placenta inside the U, which is the uterus. And you can see that when the placenta is coming through the bottom of the vaginal vault, you can see up above that there is this little open area at the, at the top of the inverted U that that is basically a wound. 
And that's a wound that we want to shut down. And typically it does because the myometrium, the muscle of the uterine wall, closes down and clamps off those vessels. Um, the placenta comes out and then hopefully we have nice tone. Sometimes, occasionally there is tissue. It may be a piece of the placenta and maybe excess clots. That may limit the ability for the uterus to become tonic or toned. And then there's other things that can happen. Trauma, you see at the bottom. There can actually be lacerations, even, even in lower resource settings that don't have forceps and vacuums that, to help um, va vaginal births that need help. Um, there can actually be enough manual or digital, uh, if you wanna call it, ma manipulation of the tissue that there can be vaginal um, sulcus tears that are created um, digitally. And then of course, the last, there are women that come into pregnancy that may even have clotting disorders, uh, problems of coagulation that we even don't know about. Next slide. So this is basically TXA. So how does it work? So TXA is a synthetic analog. It means it's a lookalike of an amino acid called lysine. And what it does, and if you can see on the bottom left, so remember, fibrin is our friend. We want to keep fibrin around to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Well, what TXA does, it inserts itself into plasminogen and actually prevents, you can see the international symbol there for it does not allow, it's not allowing plasminogen to convert to activate plasmin. And when plasminogen cannot activate to become plasmin, then we preserve, you can see again, the international symbol going from plasmin down to our fibrin clot, instead of going to the far right, where we see fibrin degradation products, in other words, breakdown of clots, we have maintenance of the fibrin clot. So again, TXA, and this is kind of a double negative, is an anti-fibrinolytic agent, is an agent that protects against the lysis of fibrin clots. How cool is that? Okay, next slide. So uh, Angela is actually going to talk a little more about its actual clinical use. Onset of action is rapid, typically given IV administration. Um, it's um, excreted primarily through the kidneys. Half-life is two hours. Um, what we're typically interested in as, as those dealing with uh, persons or women um, that are childbearing is, well, what about the baby? Does it get to the baby? It does transfer in very minuscule amounts in breast milk in a number of places that Angela and I looked. Um, there's no adverse outcomes among breastfed infants whose mothers took TXA in dosages even up to four grams daily. Okay, so that is much, much more than we give times one or times two in the immediate postpartum period. So again, the studies, you know, went uh, the nth mile, if you want to say it, but we are going to talk about a very focused, finite emergency use of TXA today. Um, next slide. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Angela. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about the use of um, TXA to treat postpartum hemorrhage in the United States. So TXA was initially approved um, by the Federal Drug um, and Administration in the United States as um, uh, for the treatment of heavy uh, menstrual bleeding. However, several studies have demonstrated that uh, it's used in, in reducing the need for blood product transfusion for postpartum hemorrhage is valid. So there are off-label clinical applications um, used in trauma and surgery, gastrointestinal bleeding, and also in, in postpartum hemorrhage. Um, TXA can be administered orally or intravenously. Um, it is currently uh, being used orally for abnormal uterine bleeding, but in the United States, we use it um, intravenously for the prevention of postpartum uh, or treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. Um, for uh, abnormal uterine bleeding, um, the IUD, the nevo Nagestral IUD has been found 
to probably have more effectiveness um, than TXA. Uh, let's see. So um, the revitalized definitions for postpartum hemorrhage is a cumulative blood loss of over a thousand um, mils or equal to a, a, a thousand mils of blood loss um, accompanied, accompanied by symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours following the birth process. Um, any blood loss, 500 to 900 milli, milliliters, um, if it's accompanied by signs and symptoms of hypovolemia, which are tachycardia, hypotension, um, tachypnea, oliguria, pallor, dizziness, or altered mental status, should also trigger increased supervision and potential interventions as clinically in indicated. Now, there are certain risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage. I will um, discuss them in low, medium, and high risk. So women who have a singleton pregnancy, um, they've had fewer than four previous births. Uh, they have an unscarred uterus, which means they hadn't had any uterine um, surgeries, um, and don't have a history of postpartum hemorrhage are categorized in low risk risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage. Um, women who have had prior C-section or any other uterine surgery have had more than four previous births, um, had prolonged use of oxytocin in <coughs> labor, um, chorioamnionides or the use of magnesium sulfate, um, have large fibroids, uterine fibroids, have multiple gestations or have a mild thrombocytopenia, which is 100 uh, to 149,000. These women will be categorized as medium risk. Higher risk women, though, are the women that have a history of postpartum hemorrhage in previous births. They have a hem hematocrit of less than 30, so they're anemic. Uh, they have a, a known coagulation defect. Um, had some bleeding on admission, history of previa, placenta previa, accreta, increta, or percreta. Uh, they have abnormal vital signs like tachycardia and hypertension. These women will be categorized as higher risk for postpartum hemorrhage. So there have been several studies um, to evaluate the uh, use, effectiveness, and efficiency, efficiency of um, TXA, the antifibrinolytic effect of uh, TXA. Um, there's an international placebo-controlled trial that evaluated the effects of early administration of a short course of TXA on death, vascular occlusive events, and um, the receipt of blood transfusion. This study included 20,211 adult trauma patients with significant hemorrhage. Um, these patients had um, systolic blood pressure less than 90 or heart rate greater than 110 beats per minute. Um, and they were at risk for significant hemorrhage and they were within eight hours of injury the injury that led to the to the um, hemorrhage. These women were um, randomized into the TXA or placebo um, category. The result shows that all course um, mortality significantly reduced in the TXA group. Um, the risk of death due to bleeding was also significantly reduced in the TXA group, and there was no apparent decrease. I mean, apparent increase in fatal or non-fatal occlusive events in both groups. And by the way, this study was across 40 countries and um, 274 hospitals. Another study, the World Maternal Antifibrinolytic <laughs> Trial, the Women Trial, uh, also an international um, study it was a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial of women 16 years or older 
with postpartum hemorrhage after vag vaginal birth or C-section. This study was conduct uh, conducted across 21 countries and 193 hospitals. Postpartum hemorrhage was clinically um, defined as estimated blood loss of less of greater than 500 um, milliliters after vaginal birth or 1,000 milliliters after uh, cesarean section or any blood loss um, sufficient enough to compromise hemodynamic stability. There were 20,060 women in this study. They all received usual care, but were also randomized to two TXA or placebo group. This study showed that death due to bleeding significantly reduced in the women that had T TXA, especially in women given treatment within three hours of given birth. There was no significant um, difference in thromboembolytic events amongst between the placebo and the TXA group. Hence, TXA reduces death due to bleeding in women with postpartum hemorrhage with no adverse effects. When used as a treatment for postpartum hemorrhage, TXA shall be given as soon as possible after the bleeding onset. So um, here is uh, information about what the different organizations have to say about um, TXA. The World Health Organization recommends that TXA should be used in all cases of postpartum hemorrhage, regardless of whether bleeding is due to genital tract trauma or other causes, and should be part of a standard postpartum hemorrhage treatment package. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the United States recommends that TXA should be considered in the setting of postpartum hemorrhage when initial medical treatment fails. The California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative recommends that TXA is used as an adjunct treatment and not a primary treatment for postpartum hemorrhage. Placement of TXA in hemorrhage guidelines Within, uh, with will depend on local resources. So now to administer TXA, the initial dose should be given within three hours after birth or the bleeding of, um, incident. The dosage is one gram in 10 milliliters or 100 milligrams per mil, and it should be given IV over 10 minutes, which equates one milliliter per minute. It should not be mixed with blood for transfusion or solutions containing mannitol or penicillin. A second dose of TXA may be given within 30 minutes after 24 hours and after 24 hours after the first dose. A history of current thrombus is contraindicated in the use of um, TXA. Meta-analysis reported that there's no increased risk of adverse events compared to placebo. And I uh, will pass this on to Ruth. I think you're muted, Ruth. I am. Who muted me? Was it me? Um, so sorry about that. So um, we're going to, we're going to, this is our last objective. It actually is objective three, not two. And I noticed that Angela said a little kind of what I call, so we like to think, I'm going to be honest with this. I like to think that TXA has a role in prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. And I know, I know Angela does too. <laughs> so, um, so we, you decided to take a look at the literature and see what was going on. And I'll just, I'll just lead off this section with, here's an example of a case. Angela looked at, showed you different risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage. In the high risk category, do you remember the first two? The first one was a history of postpartum hemorrhage. Wow, of course, somebody with a history of that same, that same stuff may be recurring, right? 
she, she has the same uterus, <laughs> the, the same whatever mm -hmm. conditions may be there. Or, um, and then the second one was actually anemia. And, and we know that even in the United States, believe it or not, we have many of our women come into childbearing very anemic. And so we have had, at men, not, not, I wouldn't say many, but we've had several cases. I can think of one where we had a woman exactly that came in in, in early active labor, history of postpartum hemorrhage or hemoglobin of nine. And, um, and she's going to have a baby within an hour, an hour and a half. She's six centimeters and she's a multip. And, you know, she's, she's, she, and she's like telling me that was terrible. What happened last time? I, they gave me blood, all this kind of stuff. So um, anyway, so, you know, we, it, we, we, we talked, I work in a hospital setting with Angela where it's one midwife and one OB and, and whatever comes in, we handle. And we talked to, to our OB colleague and he says, yeah, let's, let's give some TXA to this gal so it can get on board and be ready prior to that placenta coming out. Because remember, it, it does have some five to 15 minute time where it takes to work. So in that case, again, a team effort, we talked about it. We talked to anesthesia, um, we we're all on board, the nurses, of course, and we, we talked to the patients, say, we're gonna give you something. We don't want that to happen again. We have these other things that we can use that are more commonly used, but we wanna have like all hands on deck. So anyways, I wanted to start that off with that is kind of um, Andal and Mai's kind of passion. And I was frankly really excited when the World Health Organization uh, really proposed that TXA be part of the package of treatment um, for postpartum hemorrhage. So anyways, let me, let me go into this, this next slide. So first of all, all of us that actively attend births, active management of third stage of labor. That means we do that. That's our first step to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Really two things, that we have a uterotonic available. Remember we talked about tone being a really important one that we want to help the uterus tone itself as much as possible. That's typically oxytocin. Problem of oxytocin, it uh, actually denatures. If you don't have good refrigeration uh, in some local or some areas of the world, it's very difficult to keep in a, a reasonable potency to be used, okay? But oxytocin is what's recommended. And then cord traction. Cord traction by someone who has been trained to do that. Because we remember, we, wa we wanna have some cord traction that's enough to help assist the placenta to deliver a little earlier than it would naturally, because if it stays in there, as long as it normally would, it may be in there for hours. I mean, those of us that work in hospital settings, we always crack up because whatever the our paramedics or EMTs come running in with somebody that's had a baby at home, the placenta is always still in, even if it's two two hours earlier. You know, the, the, the uterus is a muscle and it will push out the placenta. But remember, in the meantime, when the placenta is waiting to be pushed out, a huge pl retro placental clot is developing. That is part of the mechanism for the placenta to actually deliver. If we have trained birth attendants, midwives, nurses out there that actually know how to create enough cord traction to gently ease out that placenta, we can diminish that huge amount of blood that's kind of trapped behind there. And that, that actually is one very important step. Next slide. So and eutotonics, these are what I just mentioned. Eutotonics are things that tone the uterus. Methergen is one that we use. We don't use it in women with high blood pressure because it's a vasoconstrictor. Pitocin, at least that's what we call it in the United States. Um, I think in the UK it's syntocinon, and I know there's a lot of other, it's, it's a synthetic oxytocin. We do mm -hmm. use that. And you can see on the bottom are two prostaglandins that are available as well. But I would say the two go-to in our first line are typically Pitocin. Um, and then if they're able to take it based on their risk profile, Methergen, and then we consider using um, Hemabate or Cytotec. Um, next slide. So really quickly, so what does literature say about prevention? So, so I was, when I was reviewing some of these studies and Angela has looked at these and then the collaborator on a couple of the articles have, that we've written, um, Dr. Sarah Obermeyer, I was a little bit depressed <laughs> at first because I thought there is no 
absolute definitive answer to that question yet. And I, I wanted there to be, because I wanted there to be some protocol. And um, long story made short, there really isn't yet. Um, and let me just show you. So here is a very, it's a good study with a reasonable amount. Take off my glasses so I can see this on my phone here. Um, so this was done in France, got close to 4,000 women enrolled in vaginal delivery. It was a randomized controlled trial that compared all women got oxytocin, but the control, the treatment group got oxytocin and TXA. So we're going to see, does TXA, how does it fare in women who end up having, uh, in terms of blood loss specifically? So the primary outcome was actually blood loss. And really, there was no difference in blood loss, okay, between the two groups. You're like, oh, shoot, too bad. You know, wanted it, wanted it to be yes. Okay. Secondary outcomes, severe postpartum blood loss. There really was not that much difference between the groups either. Okay. Uh, an important part of the study, however, was that it continued to demonstrate the safety of using TXA in this group of almost 4,000 women. There were no thromboembolic events in the treatment group compared to the control group or the group that got TXA compared to the control group. Okay. But this is what I want you to think about, because I know that we are taking care of women who fall into high risk categories. The problem with this study, and this is, you know, on, on even the best uh, randomized controlled trial, the researchers will talk about the limitations and the limitation in this study. It was not, it did not look at subgroups of women. It did not look at the one, the women who had a history of postpartum hemorrhage, who had um, who had issues, low hemoglobin, things I've talked about before. Therefore, its findings were really limited to the generalized use of TXA, um, and it was really not for the use of women at risk for PPH, like the case study that I, I mentioned earlier. Okay, next slide. Okay, so cesarean. I know a number of you out there in our practice, Angela and I are first assistants for cesarean. So we're a part of that woman's care from labor through the time that we decide she needs a cesarean, through the cesarean and after. And you think, well, um, it's actually been considered, well, maybe it's a good thing to prevent um, hemorrhage in women having cesarean. Well, this was an interesting, a systematic uh, review. So it, lo it looked at a number of studies and a meta-analysis of 18 RCTs. So it looked at 18 studies and it kind of glommed them into one big study. And they, these are the study results. I'll talk about some of the problems with that, but the positive, it, it showed some trends. It showed that there was, in terms of cesarean use, there was, a 60% reduction in the risk of mild to moderate PPH, which in this study um, was, in many of the studies, defined at only 400 cc's EBL. Um, and there was actually, in, in terms of severe PPH, a 68% reduction. Okay, you say, okay, well, that sounds good. However, here comes the however. The limitations was that when you have 18 different studies done internationally in different countries, the definition of PPH was different. Um, there was the one gram protocol was only used in 14 of the 18 studies. So you had four studies that used a slightly different protocol. And there was heterogeneity of the participants. Some of the women, some of the women had higher risk factors than others. So anyways, it showed some trends, but really didn't show us absolutely that it prevents um, postpartum hemorrhage and cesarean. So next slide. So this is, this is what um, is going on now, and I'm gonna show you a couple studies that are in process that they're, I just want you to stay tuned, and I know you'll get the, the slide references for later, so please stay tuned. I know I've been checking on these. This is called, um, uh, or actually this is the TRAP2 trial, and this is one that was designed the same way as the other French studies, same as researchers, it was on cesarean. And I should go ahead, this actually is a completed study I'm gonna show you. But this study did show that in this study for cesarean, there were significantly fewer women with blood loss greater than 1,000 milliliters, which Angela mentioned is really the current definition that could and should be used. At least that's what's being used in the United States, okay? 
However, there was no difference in the use or need for additional agents or transfusion. In other words, there was some slightly different, different blood loss, but it did not change the management significantly. Remember, TXA, remember Angela showed you the two studies, TXA prevents, reduces mortality which is obviously really what the, the bottom line is. We want to reduce mortality related to postpartum hemorrhage. Um, it showed some difference in terms of blood loss, but not reduction in mortality. So therefore, I'm just gonna read this orange box. This study does not suggest that prophylaxis or prophylactic use of TXA has sufficient- a two minute uh, window. Okay, I'm going to take a little longer because we actually use 10 minutes to do the introduction. So sorry, I'm going to, I'm almost done. Okay. Thank you, Jackson. So this study um, does not suggest that it has significant benefits um, at this point for women experiencing cesarean in this general group, again, a general group. So going to the next slide, we're almost done. You guys hang with me. So again, there's two studies and these are the ones I mentioned before. There is a randomized controlled trial with 11,000 women, women which is underway to assess whether prophylactic TSA use reduces the risk of PS, uh, PPH in women under, undergoing cesarean, okay? So keep track of that. You can see the clinicaltrials.gov number there. Um, and, and this will be a very important one in terms of whether or not we will use it for prevention in terms of cesarean. The next slide, and this is the other one I want to tell you about that actually is more germane to us because we are most likely with vaginal birth. This is another study that's underway that recognizes that one of three pregnant women worldwide are anemic, and therefore um, are much more susceptible to the uh, morbidity related to postpartum hemorrhage and ultimately mortality. So this is a study that is looking at women specifically who are anemic it is looking at that one subset that was not addressed or could not be addressed in that smaller study. It's looking at anemic women only and whether the use of prophylactic TXA will be beneficial for reducing mortality, okay? So I, I just, I want that to be the stay tuned and I'm gonna close with the next two slides and then we'll get a little discussion time here, okay? So, you know, as Angela mentioned, the the United States does not use TXA. We do not use TXA as a part of our standard package of postpartum hemorrhage treatment. We use it as a secondary kind of, we've already used our oxytocin, our methogen, our Cytotec, our Hemabate, whatever we've done. And now we consider, wow, well, maybe it's not, maybe it's a clot problem. Remember, TXA fixes clot problems. So we use it as adjunctive therapy. However, there is a researcher, um, Sudhoff, who's in the, the references that you'll see that talks about that increasingly, because TXA is, is pretty inexpensive, that TXA may be considered or, or actually could be later on, could be cost savings. There might be cost savings when used routinely for PPA. So I just want to to mention that to you. We are a high resource setting in low resource settings. Remember, the World Health Organization has already stated that because they talk about the world and they recognize that most of the world's babies are born in low resource settings. TXA being a part of the treatment package can save lives. And that's, that's the bottom line. So go ahead, I hear a dog barking there. So that must mean, mean the signal for the presentation almost be over. <laughs> when the dog barks, it means it's time to go. All right, so the conclusions here. So let's be comfortable and familiar with its use. Um, let's, let's identify risk factors. Find the women in your community who have had hemorrhages before in the context of childbirth. Let's get them to a higher level of care or get, get materials ready for them, okay? And um, really important things that Angela mentioned that TXA should be given within three hours. It should not be used in women with a history of thromboembolic disease. That is a given. That is an absolute contraindication, okay? And then just remember, there is high quality research um, on the use for prevention underway. It's not completely clear yet, 
but I feel like even in the next several years, there will be some high, really high quality studies. Not that the ones that have been done already are not high quality, but they just had enough limitations that we can't apply them yet. But there may be some suggested uh, um, ability to use it more regularly for prevention in uh, research risk rich countries as well. So um, let's just, I think that's the conclusion part. Let's step through the references so they get on the video. That's one page. You can look at those later. Next page of references. And then there's a last page of references. And then there's just a thank you slide.